following podcast was recorded on Wednesday, October 5th, 2022, featuring Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. Welcome, Sam. Good morning, Kristen. Today, Sam discusses what today's OPEC meeting means for the oil complex. Sam, what's the potential impact on the global economy and oil prices? Well, it's interesting that they chose this meeting to kind of make the headline of 2 million um, barrels worth of a cut. You know, it's probably actually going to mean something a little bit lower than 2 million. That's the suggested caps, et cetera. Uh, so you're probably closer to a million when it comes down to the actual numbers. But what's really intriguing about this time around is they did it in the middle of what I would say is already a market that's short oil right? It's, it's short of oil. We don't have enough in the world to go around, uh, particularly in Europe. What it really means in kind of my mind is you probably have a floor in oil prices for the medium term around $80 a barrel. It's going to be very difficult to push oil prices lower than that, uh, simply given that there's not enough supply online already and you're taking 2 million barrels off and you have the SPR uh, coming, uh, uh, dispersion coming off. Uh, those two things in and of themselves are probably going to continue to at least provide a floor in oil prices. It's also probably more of an issue for Europe than it is for Asia. One of the, the trends we've seen over the past uh, several months has been Saudi Arabia setting oil prices lower for Asian delivery and uh, at least flat to uh, call it maybe marginally higher for Europe and uh, the US. That That is something to watch as well, uh, where this might be much more, uh, much more of a problem for the Western world than it will for Asia uh, in general. That's, that's something to really keep an eye on here. Uh, one, of the pe one of the pieces of information that kind of gets overlooked in the oil supply story is that a lot of the Russian oil that was flowing to Europe uh, previously is now flowing to China, it's flowing to India, and those were very large market share uh, places for Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia has begun to see their market share fall in both countries. That's somewhat problematic uh, given that India and China are two of the larger and growing markets uh, for oil imports, and so I think there's going to be an interesting dynamic around how this cut actually uh, gets uh, pushed out uh, by OPEC, and it's probably much worse for Europe and uh, the Western world than it is for Asia. Let's take a step back for a moment. What was the effect of the pre-pandemic narrative, lower for longer oil prices? Yeah, this is, this is one that, again, gets overlooked a lot. Right? It's worth remembering that in 2014, Saudi Arabia said, no, uh, no, 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 no. We're not going to continue to have 100 plus uh, barrel oil prices and have the United States uh, begin to become the world's largest oil producer. Um, that, was, that was a catalyst for a number of things. One, it was a catalyst for uh, the U.S. beginning to pull back incremental investment in the oil patch. Uh, it didn't. It didn't really call it knock down U.S. oil production uh, by a meaningful amount, but it did uh, decrease the rate of change that the U.S. had. Right, the U.S. was growing oil production at a rather rapid clip, uh, but then you had OPEC begin to dump barrels on the market, and that pushed oil prices down to 40 to. $30 a barrel, uh, and that that caused investors in the U.S. to step back uh, from the oil patch. There was, you know, at $100 a barrel, there were great returns. At $30 a barrel, there were not great returns. Uh, so you, you had underinvestment in the U.S. oil patch for the better part of a decade, and that creates a scenario today where you simply don't have enough oil that can come online to satisfy uh, global demand uh, when the U.S. is probably the largest marginal producer of crude or potential producer of crude. Um, 
the only other places that you can really look are Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran. Uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't have as much spare capacity as they, as people kind of think. There's probably less than a million barrels of spare capacity there. Um, Iran and Venezuela are, are pretty much the only two, uh, maybe Russia, but that's not happening anytime soon. Uh, but Venezuela and Iran are pretty much the only two places where you can really look for incremental barrels on this market, and those aren't going to come online anytime soon. Uh, so it's it's an interesting story of you really knock down U.S. oil production uh, in 2014, and and that was the story of CapEx for the next six years was where do you get the money to do it? Can you make money at 30 or 40, 50 dollars barrel? Probably not. Uh, so it, it, that that became an issue, and that is really exacerbating uh, the global market at the moment. And to, frankly, we haven't seen that much investment in the U.S. oil patch with energy prices at 80 to 120 over the last nine months. So it's it's one of those stories where the U.S. pulling back is much more, and the U.S. being the whipsaw of the global market, is much more of a story that gets overlooked than it should. We want to focus next on the role that China plays and what happens when China ends its COVID zero strategy. Yeah, this is this is again something that gets overlooked radically. So China is the fifth largest producer of oil. That's that's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, the other piece of the puzzle is they're massive importers of crude. They they, they don't have enough uh, domestically. They have to import. Um, that you know that's. That's something that happens. They're also, this is something else that gets overlooked. They also have the av longest average commute to and from work uh, when the economy is open. Uh, so their demand for gasoline is very high. Uh, when you have them shut down or at least rolling shutdowns, uh, that's, that's not positive for crude. When you have a completely open China, that's going to be a different demand scenario than it is today. Much more will be demanded by China, much uh, and, you know, if supplies aren't there, that's going to push oil up significantly. Uh, so the COVID zero policy has has been a headwind uh, for oil has been in food prices, frankly. Uh, and when they begin to reopen, it's going to potentially become a much larger problem uh, for the energy complex uh, than is than is anticipated, particularly if we continue to have OPEC taking barrels offline. Um, that's that's something to really pay attention to. Uh, it's it's going to be a problem. And when did the global energy crunch really begin? It really it really began when you had the U.S. and most of your most of the call it developed uh, world begin to reopen. Um, that that's that's really when you had the energy crunch uh, begin to step in. I mean, it's worth kind of looking back. And before you had uh, call it uh, before you had the rolling shutdowns of different cities in China, the COVID zero policy really taking hold. You actually had uh, China cutting uh, electricity uh, supplies to various industries uh, during COVID. So it was it was something I, I think people weren't really paying attention to until it really smacked them in the face with Europe being short energy. Uh, it began somewhere around, uh, call it 2021, at least the most recent energy. Uh, crunch uh, beginning of 2021 to mid 2021 was kind of the time frame that you really began to see that you know those negative oil prices were very very much transitory and there really wasn't enough oil on the market for reopened global economy. Uh, the other side of it is Europe never really um, paid attention uh, to what was going on. It was very very cheap uh, to buy. Russian gas imported, Russian oil, uh, Russian distillates, gasoline, diesel, et cetera, uh, import it and you didn't have to really worry about it, right? It was call it the fall of the Berlin Wall was great for European energy. Uh, when you became that dependent and Europe was extremely dependent on Russian energy supplies, when you became that dependent, it was pretty easy to see that if you got cut off, you were going to be in trouble. Uh, and Europe's domestic gas production had been in decline for the better part of two decades. Basically, the day that Russia was, quote unquote, open to the West was the, call it, mid call it the midterm peak of uh, European gas uh, production. And it's been in pretty steady decline. Uh, since then on the production end of it. So I think I think it's a little bit of a, call it an issue, uh, 
uh, that was overlooked until it was right there. Uh, so it's been it's been a problem in the making, but it really began to rear its head uh, in early 21. What's a potential solution? <laughs> Well, I mean, there's there's a couple. One is importing U.S. LNG, which means the U.S. would have to begin production in a pretty sizable way to really pick up its ability to uh, supply European gas. Uh, on the other side, there's there's the potential for renewables to become a, a larger mix, particularly uh, in Europe uh, and the U.S. Right? There's there's some of that. The the issue being that. Uh, when you kind of cut off nuclear, which is great for base power because it's very steady, it can be fairly cheap, particularly relative to what we're seeing in natural gas prices at the moment. Uh, so you, there's some potential there. Uh, China's so far ahead when it comes to uh, solar installation uh, than the U.S., than Europe. Uh, if the if the European Union really wanted to be able to reduce its uh, current uh, reliance on natural gas, you'd really have to pick that up. Uh, again, that's that's baseline for you know when it's sunny. Uh, that doesn't solve all the problems. So I do think that you're going to have to have a much more thoughtful mix of energy supplies than simply going to wind or solar or nuclear. It's probably going to be all three, uh, with the U.S. LNG being a very very important part of the mix as we begin to move forward. Is higher for longer transitory? No, higher for longer is something that I, I don't think people have really fully embraced in the energy market. Uh, you have th you, got, you have three things right now that are working against oil. You have the US in recession narrative or US heading for a recession narrative. You have an extremely strong dollar and you have China with a zero COVID policy. Those are three negatives for oil prices globally. And you still have $80 oil. I, I think I, I was quoted in the Wall Street Journal recently as saying, uh, we'll look at $80, $80 a barrel oil and that'll seem cheap. And I, I would say that as we move forward, it's going to feel like $80 was a, a huge moment um, and that's not going to last. Sam, thank you for your thoughts today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions on today's podcast or in regards to Arbor Research, Bianco Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks everyone and have a great day.